and let me once again officially welcome everyone to today's webinar, Combating Teen Dating Violence, Promising Research and Prevention and Inter Intervention for Youth at Risk. Today's webinar is sponsored by the National Institute of Justice and the Harvard Kennedy School's Government Innovators Network. I'd like to turn things over to today's moderator, Dr. Carrie Mulford, who's a social science analyst at the National Institute of Justice. Dr. Mulford. Thank you, uh, and welcome. Um, I manage NIK's uh, research portfolio on teen dating violence in addition to several topics that you see on the screen. And we are thrilled that you could join us um, today for what promises to be a very exciting and thought-provoking discussion on the prevention of teen dating violence among high-risk populations. As many of you probably know, on January 28th, Congress passed a resolution designating February as Teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month. The National Institute of Justice is hosting this month's webinar to commemorate the passage of the resolution. And before we proceed, I'd like to apologize for the title of the event. One of my CDC colleagues pointed out the uh, incongruence of using violent terminology like combating when we're talking about combating teen dating violence or any other form of violence. Um, when we want to ameliorate or prevent a, a type of violence, uh, it might make sense to use more peaceful terminology. So her point is well noted and something I think that we should all strive to avoid. So in the future, that will not happen again. Um, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a very brief overview on, of teen dating violence, and then I'm going to introduce our speakers one by one and then let, that, let them take it away. So with that, advance the slide here. Okay, um, so what is teen dating violence? It's a commonly used term to describe a range of abusive behaviors that adolescents experience in the context of a romantic or intimate relationship. Um, it can include physical, sexual, psychological abuse, and stalking. Um, now, we know that teen dating violence is not the best descriptive term. It's not the term that, that youth would use, that adolescents would use, but it's a widely recognized term, so we've stuck with that term. Uh, the problem, um, in part, with the term is that Adolescents don't call it dating, and violence is at the you know at the end of the spectrum of all of these other abusive behaviors that we're trying to prevent. The range of psychological abuse is vast and can include uh, verbal insults, controlling behavior, like telling a partner what they can wear, who they can talk to, and the types of technological abuse that are fairly common among adolescents: um, excessive texting, etc. Now, how prevalent is teen dating violence? These are um, estimates from general population studies. So when we talk about the populations we're going to be talking more about today, the high risk groups, uh, these would be these numbers would be higher. And in some research, we seen that they are higher. But these are some the numbers just from uh, some general population studies. One in ten experiencing physical aggression in the past 12 months. Uh, 20 to 30 percent experiencing psychological aggression in the past year. Those numbers range wildly from the 20 percent to 90 percent, depending on the way that question is asked. Um, sexual violence and severe violence are far less common. Obviously, that's I think fairly uh, intuitive. And then um, I put this up here because it's an indication of the movement in this field and an indication of how much recognition this topic has been receiving over the past several years. Um, eight states have passed legislation requiring schools to have teen dating violence policies and education. Uh, if I had done this last year, there were only two states. To date, two others have introduced legislation so far in 2010, um, and two others have legislation that strongly encourages this but doesn't require it. And many states are making it easier for minors to get protection orders against their current or former romantic partners, um, another indication that teen dating violence is gaining recognition. Um, and we know that the prevention of teen dating violence cannot be accomplished through any one approach or program. Um, and we have, although the focus of today's panel is on the prevention of teen dating violence among high risk youth, we all of us, all of us in the panel recognize that primary universal prevention approaches that help to change norms are critical so that abusive behaviors aren't considered to be an accepted or accepted part of an intimate relationship. Our panelists will provide perspectives from three different settings where they are engaged in efforts to promote healthy, non-abusive, romantic relationships um, among adolescents who are at risk for involvement in teen dating violence. 
Uh, Dr. Wolf is the director of the Center for Prevention Science and prevention professor of psychology and psychiatry at the University of Toronto, and he will be our first speaker. Dr. Wolf is well known in the field for his program development and evaluation of the fourth R, a school-based program designed to reduce teen dating violence and improve relationship skills. And he's going to talk about an adaption, adaptation, sorry, of uh, the program that's intended for use with high-risk youth. So, um, I'm going to turn the virtual floor over to Dr. Wolf. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to speak about uh, how we've developed a program called the 4R. Let me just see if I can get this to operate. Jim, I might need your help because I'm not seeing it up on the screen. Oh, here it is. Okay. Which I call Strategies for Healthy Youth Relationships. Several years, many years ago, uh, I was seeking ways to, to uh, develop child abuse. And to make a long story short, we ended up uh, focusing on adolescents for a very important reason. This is a really terrific window of opportunity in early adolescence to teach them about healthy relationships. And to me, that's one of the most uh, uh, successful ways to approach the issue, not only of teen dating violence, but a lot of other forms of future violence in their lives. We take the approach that in adolescence, the risk behaviors, including other forms of violence and teen dating violence, travel together. They're all swimming in the sea of relationships. We call it sexual behavior, alcohol, drug use, and all forms of violence tend to co-occur. And people have known this for many years, but we still tend to focus too much on one of these issues. And usually, if you have a kid involved in teen dating violence as a victim or an offender, there may be, or as often is, alcohol or inappropriate sexual behavior, unsex unsafe sexual behavior going on at the same time. So if we want to prevent teen dating violence, we have to be sensitive to the context in which it occurs and the fact that these kids are trying to navigate relationships where there's incredible pressure on them for unsafe sex and experimentation with alcohol and drugs. <clears throat> so what we've been doing over the last 20 years my colleagues and I, is to develop ways to teach adolescents through the schools or through after-school programs or special community programs about healthy relationships. And as you see on the screen, these are our goals and strategies of the fourth R, which stands for relationships. Help youth strengthen their skills to make responsible choices, address the goals of adolescents that they're after. They're really trying to navigate the situations in their relationships. To counteract a lot of these pro-abuse messages that you see in their culture about race and gender and sexual orientation, these all are part of teen dating violence, all of these attitudes in their culture. To prepare them and not necessarily scare them around this issue, to give a positive message of safety and harm reduction is, is the strategy we use, and to help them build youth connections, because the, the strategies we've used in the schools and after schools is really youth involved. It has to come from them. It's for them, it's by them, and it's with them. And that's the strategy that, that, uh, that we believe in very strongly. This next slide just shows you some of the resources that we've been working on, just so you'll have a sense of what I'm talking about. That the second one, the grade 9 and 10 core physical ed and health, is the fourth R program that we just evaluated. It was published last August, and I think that resource will be available to you. Um, that's delivered by teachers in the high schools. And I'm a strong believer that that universal strategy is what really we need to be working towards. But that's not the only way that we can, be, can do this. We also have it now uh, expanded to grades 7 and 8. There's five communities in the U.S. that are uh, working with us on that as part of the Start Strong program. Two years ago, we, we developed a curriculum in English. And when I say this, I'm pointing out that what we do is have educators uh, write programs on teen dating violence and related issues that fits the requirements of the curriculum, especially in English, because all kids have to take English. All kids have to take physical ed at some point. And believe it or not, in the English curriculum in all states and provinces, um, there are issues in there around conflict resolution, reading novels, and so forth. And we have materials so that they can read about relationships and things that would help them with teen dating violence. We also have developed other programs for our Aboriginal partners, kids who are in, in the alternative education schools, and then the after-school program, which I'll be talking about um, for the rest of my few minutes here. The youth relationship started back in 1995. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, it was published in 2003 when we evaluated the program. 
and that was for higher risk kids, kids that grew up in violent homes or abusive homes, because we felt that if we can demonstrate that they can improve, if they can learn healthy relationship skills and not repeat the cycle of violence with their dating partners, then we can probably teach this to all kids. And that's exactly what we did find. Um, I'm not going to go over that result, but that's, that's what we found in that program. And now we've modified it more recently. Um, we now call it the after school program to supplement or to, as an alternative really for ones that are taught by teachers that I mentioned. This is the simplest way to deliver the program, simpler than having, than, uh, having teacher involvement because of the cost and such, but um, more difficult in the sense of rounding up kids and making sure that everyone receives it. But if you're working with a higher risk population, working with kids with, that um, you feel really need a, a more one-to-one -one contact or small group contact, after school is the way to go. And the next slide I'll show you is... Um, Dr. Wolf, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Jim Cooney. Um, we have a few people who are having trouble hearing you. Perhaps you can adjust your mic or just speak a little louder. I could pick up the phone and get rid of the mic. I'm talking to a headset. Um, that might, that'll probably work well, too. Okay, hold on. Hope I don't lose everybody. Is everybody there? Yes, and the sound is much better. Oh, boy. Sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> okay. I'll start back at the beginning now. Uh, the after-school program, here are the 12 sessions that we now um, have been piloting. There's a group in Seattle doing this for us and one in Vancouver. Um, the idea of the after-school program is it's small groups of kids uh, to really get their engagement and going. And it, um, this, these 12 sessions are for the younger kids, generally ages 12 to 14. And then there will be a second 12 sessions, which we're working on now. Again, it's an update of the youth relationships from uh, 2003 to deal with the bigger issues around drugs and alcohol. Uh, I don't have time to go into these lessons, obviously, but these are the 12 sessions that go for about an hour after school or however the communities want to organize it. <coughs> we also have video resources. Part of the, just as a sample of what we're trying to teach the kids in the classroom is skills. We're really trying to teach them how to, uh, at this age, how to handle pressure situations. So there's a lot of examples and videos, some of which were made by kids in the program or kids in the high schools, um, to really teach them how to handle assertion, aggression, delay, negotiation, and so forth. If you have any questions about it, I've got a, our book is listed there from 2006, which describes the whole theory behind what we do, as well as the program itself. And then my last slide here is just some information. So I think that takes me to my 10 minutes, Jim, and uh, I'll be available for questions and answers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Miller, who's an assistant professor of pediatrics from the University of California, Davis. Dr. Miller is involved in an exciting program of intervention research that uses health clinics as a setting for reaching youth at high risk for relationship violence. She will discuss some uh, results of her work in Boston and Northern California with an emphasis on how sexual coercion, hard perception sabotage are related to abuse in relationships. Wonderful, Carrie. Thank you. And let me just let's see, make sure I get my slides up. Am I doing this right, Jim? You're done. You're there. Indeed. Okay. okay. There we go. Okay. Even, even for those of us who are less technologically savvy, I think we're here. And um, so by way of introduction, I am certainly here as both a clinician and a researcher. It's an incredible privilege to be part of this panel. So thank you, Carrie, so much for organizing this. The, um, my role here is to actually talk about teen clinics, um, clinical spaces that serve teens. Um, as a potential site for prevention and intervention and wanted to share with you some of our data um, from both Boston and Northern California. So as um, Gary was pointing out, um, as, and as well as Dr. Wolf, um, adolescent relationship and um, adolescent relationship abuse and health really sits within a clustering of other vulnerabilities. As Dr. Wolf was pointing out, violence, sexual behavior, and alcohol and substance use often go hand in hand. 
And certainly the epidemiologic literature looking at this over the last 15 years has confirmed this for us. So we know that it's highly associated, um, that relationship abuse is highly associated with a range of poor health outcomes for youth. And the ones I'm going to focus on primarily today are um, reproductive health related. So pregnancy, we've known for the last two decades, um, is a highly vulnerable time for women regardless of their age. But when we look at teen pregnancy specifically, the prevalence of abuse so preceding conception, during the course of pregnancy, and in, in the immediate postpartum period um, appears to be at least two to three times greater than for adult women. In one particular study, it was as high as two-thirds of the pregnant and parenting teens reporting abusive relationships as um, part of their pregnancy experience. When we then turn to sexual risk, and by that I mean risk for sexually transmitted infections in HIV, um, the data also is very consistent, showing that youth report, um, youth experiencing partner violence also have higher rates of sexually transmitted infections, that's what STD stands for, um, as well as HIV infection. And interestingly, and I want you to hold on to this, they're also more likely to come in for testing. Um, and I'm going to come back to that point in a moment. So very quickly, first, our Boston-based data. So this was actually out of five confidential teen clinics um, in the greater Boston area. Two of the clinics were located in high schools. One was located in a community health center, one in a youth agency, and the fifth clinic was a freestanding <clears throat> teen clinic that was actually located inside a post office building. By far my most favorite one because you could come in to buy stamps and leave with your bag of condoms. So in that... Um, the clinic-based survey, we had, it was completely anonymous, and um, I'm going to focus here just on our data from the girls, because um, I'm going to tie this back to, to risk for, for pregnancy in a moment. Um, but among the adolescent girls coming in for care, um, we found very high prevalence of both physical and sexual violence, and I want you to focus on that 40% at the bottom. So these were all comers into teen clinics. They could be coming in for a rash, for a mental health reason, for a pregnancy test, for a sports physical. What we found was that it absolutely did not matter what you were coming in for. Um, or to, to put it another way, those youth who are seeking care, and adolescent females seeking care in these teen clinics um, have a very high prevalence of experiences of, of abuse in their relationships. And here I'm defining abuse very narrowly as physical and or sexual violence in their intimate relationship. Now, along with doing this clinic survey, we also did very in-depth interviews with both um, males and females um, both who were known to have um, experienced abusive relationships, to hear their story. And um, the, among the stories that we heard were stories like this around condom manipulation. The first couple of times the condom seems to break every time, you know what I mean? It was just kind of funny. The first six times the condom broke. Six condoms, that's kind of rare. I could understand one, but six times. After that, when I got on birth control, he was just like always saying, you should have my baby, you should have my daughter, you should have my kid. Um, and this was a young woman who actually came into clinic to get a Depo-Provera shot without her partner's knowledge um, after these condoms kept breaking. We then heard from another, an 18-year-old who had a 2-year-old son at the time of this interview talking about her pregnancy. I was on birth control. I was still taking it. He ended up getting mad and flushing it down the toilet, so I ended up getting pregnant. I found out that before this, he talked to my friends. He told them we were starting a family. I didn't know that. I didn't want to start a family. I wanted to finish school. So the combination of our clinic-based survey work and these um, in-depth stories resulted in our kind of defining this phenomenon that we have called reproductive coercion. Um, that's a combination of both birth control sabotage, active interference with contraceptive methods, um, as well as pregnancy coercion. These are threats or pressure to promote a pregnancy. Um, and it can in include things like your partner threatening to leave you if you don't get pregnant, um, uh, your partner telling you not to use any birth control so you would get pregnant. 
based on this work um, in Boston, I was very fortunate when moving to California a few years ago to partner with Planned Parenthood of Northern California, um, along with the Family Violence Prevention Fund and my colleagues at the Harvard School of Public Health. And we piloted an intervention um, to say, well, what if we actually start to assess for reproductive coercion? What if we actually utilize that as a way to enhance our partner violence screening in clinic? What if we are then able to offer longer acting contraceptives, such as um, injectable contraceptives or intrauterine devices, and utilize that clinic visit as a way to connect women to partner violence related um, resources, certainly including sexual assault. And what you have here is a diagram sort of describing those components of the intervention. We did a very small trial. Um, of four clinics, two received the intervention, two were the control, and focused on young adult women ages 16 to 29. All comers completed um, a pre-visit um, clinic visit survey, then completed an exit survey right after the clinic visit, and then were followed up three months later. So part of um, just to give you a sense of who we're talking about, now these are freestanding family planning clinics in Northern California. They serve young women, so 43% were ages 16 to 19, and um, about a third were African American and about a third Latina. Um, and we know that these family planning clinics specifically serve lower income communities. The prevalence of physical and sexual violence in their relationships was stunning. Across every single clinic, over half of the women reported ever experiencing physical or sexual violence from a partner. 17.6% reported violence in the past three months. And then in terms of reproductive coercion, this too was not uncommon. Um, just over a quarter of women said they'd experienced reproductive coercion. You can then see what this looks like visually in the bar graph where, just to walk you through this very quickly, where it says ITVS, that means those women who said that they had ever experienced partner violence, and um, ITV no, never experienced partner violence. And what I want to point out is that no surprise, those women who have ex ever experienced partner violence were also more likely to have experienced reproductive control. Um, and there's quite an overlap. This pale cream is pregnancy coercion. The burgundy, a combination of both birth control sabotage and pregnancy coercion. And then another 8% of birth control sabotage only. The point of this bar graph is to show the overlap between partner violence and reproductive coercion, but also to point out that there were at least 7% of women in our sample who were experiencing reproductive coercion but had never experienced physical or sexual violence at the hands of a partner. How this sort of uh, played out in terms of analyses is that we found that those women who were reprodu reported reproductive coercion only um, actually did not have an elevated risk for unintended pregnancy. In contrast, those women who reported ever experiencing physical or sexual violence at the hands of a partner and experienced reproductive coercion had a twofold increased risk for unintended pregnancy. And the point here is that when we think about prevention, this, is, I think, is an immense opportunity for us in the prevention field to be thinking about how partner violence prevention can also be tied to teen pregnancy prevention very explicitly. And then very quickly to say, well, does the intervention work? Underscoring the fact that this was, as far as intervention studies go, a very small um, cluster randomized trial. What we found is among those women in the intervention group who experienced partner violence in the past three months, um, at their three-month follow-up, we had a 70% reduction in pregnancy coercion. In addition, we also asked women about whether they had ended a relationship um, in follow-up and found that those women in the intervention group were significantly more likely to have ended a relationship because it felt unhealthy or unsafe. We were especially pleased with that finding because nowhere during the course of the intervention were women told to leave a relationship. So it's just an opportunity to provide education around reproductive coercion and connect them to, um, to safe resources. So in summary, 
Um, I think we all know, and the reason you all are on this call, is that adolescent relationship abuse is certainly common. And I think my role here as the, as the clinician researcher is to underscore that um, the adolescent relationship abuse is highly prevalent in clinical settings and that clinical settings represent a really important place for us to do some intervention and prevention work. I am currently working on adapting what we did in family planning settings specifically for teen-specific clinics, um, recognizing that we need to pay much more attention to doing developmentally appropriate messaging, preparing providers to do more mandated on how to do safe mandated reporting, and, um, and the additional sort of feasibility testing in teen clinic settings. Um, but one of the things that I do want to um, emphasize is that for those of you who are on the call who work currently in domestic violence agencies and the sexual assault and rape crisis centers, that school health centers and teen clinics in your community may not necessarily be places that you are working yet um, at, at this point, but I would strongly encourage that kind of partnership as I really think that um, there's lots of mutual learning to be done. We're currently funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Programs to develop a toolkit for um, adolescent healthcare providers that should be um, becoming available, I hope, by late spring, early summer. Finally, um, just so um, to, to touch base on the, the social norms change and primary prevention efforts, um, our team is also working on um, a program that was um, founded by the Family Violence Prevention Fund and is currently supported by the funders that you see on the slide, which is working with high school coaches um, to talk to their male athletes about stopping violence against women. Um, and so that study is currently um, being done across 16 high schools in the Sacramento region as a uh, randomized trial. And uh, hopefully we will be you know, back to you next year with um, some promising findings from that. So thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. And uh, uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Pat Pelosi, who is the President and CEO of Healthy Teen Network, which is a national membership organization that's dedicated to improving health outcomes for adolescents. Dr. Pelosi will talk about how dating violence is experienced by high risk and marginalized teens, specifically pregnant and parenting teens. So Pat, I turn it over to you. Okay. Thanks very much, Carrie. I want to add my thanks to the previous two speakers for the opportunity to be able to talk about how violence affects the lives of our young people, and particularly how um, intimate violence can affect some of our most marginalized youth, and specifically pregnant and parenting teens. And I come to this uh, conversation as a longtime advocate and educator on issues of violence against women, and also as the head of the only national organization that focuses on the needs of pregnant and parenting teens. Okay, wait a minute here. Okay. So we've heard a lot of research um, in our last talk, um, and specific research is being done, but just to reiterate a few facts. Uh, we do know that adolescents and young adults experience incredibly high degrees of intimate violence, more than any other age group. And as a subgroup, young women ages 16 to 24 are the most likely to be victimized. Dr. Pelosi, hi, this is Jim Cooney. Um, same, uh, same complaints as with uh, Dr. Wolf earlier. It sounds like you're coming in pretty soft for some people. Okay, I'll speak up. I'm, I am holding my phone in my hand, so I'll just speak oh, okay. more loudly. No, just, okay. Yeah, just do the best you can. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Among our young women who are more vulnerable to be victimized or are more likely to be victimized, of course, teen mothers are especially vulnerable. In one study, we see that teen mothers reported intimate partner violence rates of 27% compared to almost 16% of adult women. And we heard other reports from our previous speaker, so we see that this one is, is following the twofold um, possibility that she mentioned. Other relation, relating factors for teen moms, we know that um, many of our pregnant and parenting teens come from a lower socioeconomic group. Many of them have histories of past abuse, can suffer from low education attainment, either previous to or as a result of the pregnancy and parenting, and can be very, very isolated. 
uh, especially once they've had the baby, uh, being a young mom can be very isolating in and of itself. For a new mom, I should say, can be isolating for anyone, and especially for our young teens who may no longer be in school or have any other kind of resources or support services available to them. We also know that as teenagers, that they can be simultaneously abused by both family members and intimate partners. And so we have to be mindful of that both in our screening and in thinking about their living situations. And we also know that for young people that some of the policies, such as the housing stipulations that are attached to temporary assistance for needing families, um, TANF, can perpetuate violent living situations for some of these vulnerable mothers. That is, in order to receive TANF, you have to live with another adult, and if that adult happens to be your abuser and you don't feel that you have any way out or homelessness is your only option, that sometimes is not the most supportive policy for this population. In terms of just some of the other consequences, we've heard a bit already, but as we know, unintended pregnancies, HIV, and sexually transmitted infections can be increased among those who are being abused, also increased rates of depression and ideas, thoughts of suicide, and also associated with other risky behaviors as we've heard previously. Certainly we also know that youth experiencing child and family abuse as well as growing up with intimate partner violence in their family of origin will be impacted well into adulthood. And although research is very conflicted on exactly what that means and that it may be different for young boys and for young girls, there still is an impact. And abused teen parents may be less able to parent effectively. They may feel more withdrawn from their children, and thus they may be perpetuating a cycle of neglect and abuse and unhealthy relationships in those children as well. For pregnant and parenting teens, as we've talked about, and for some of our other marginalized populations, dating violence might be just one issue among many that poses some danger and challenges for them. They may live in communities or in families that pose violent threats. They may be on the streets. They may be homeless. They may feel that, like this relationship, even if it's not the healthiest relationship, even if it places them in some harm, um, is safer than some of the other things that they have to deal with in their lives. They may not feel that this is the most important issue for them, and in fact, there, there are other needs that are being met that balance it out as far as they're concerned. We've heard about uh, a great, I loved your presentation, on the condom and birth control sabotage that can happen in this kind of relationship. And among pregnant and parenting teens, we know that these folks are having similar relationship dynamics um, that adults might have with new babies and relationships that have fewer skills, so therefore are more likely to perhaps break down in their relationships. We heard about the relationship between intimate partner violence and unintended pregnancies, and we know that most teen pregnancies are, in fact, unintended. There were a couple of studies that came out a few years back. One was done in Maryland and one was done in the district where medical examiner offices had performed autopsies and gone back and looked at autopsies reports on women who had died, um, who had been killed by their significant partners and had found that more than half of them were pregnant, whether or not um, that had been diagnosed at the time or not. So very interesting findings and really poses, uh, tells you how risky it is to be pregnant, particularly with an unintended pregnancy um, in, in an abusive relationship. And again, with increased isolation and in some of the policies that don't support pregnant and parenting teens, it can be harder to serve them at times. Specifically to teens, not just pregnant and parenting teens, but certainly all teens, there are certain behaviors that we have to keep in mind. And one is that it's often a fine line in a teen's mind between what is possessive behavior and what we think is really unhealthy behavior. And I think that approaching this from the point of building healthy relationships is exactly the way to go, as our first speaker pointed out. Because you can all remember, we know teenagers well enough to know that if he only wants to spend time with us or she only wants to spend time with him, we think it's because they love us when we're really young and we don't understand perhaps that difference between uh, what kind of isolating behavior that can lead to um, down the road. It's also really challenging to address the needs of all youth with one curriculum or intervention, which is why our first speaker's approach, which is prevention, building unhealthy relationships, starting young, continuing all through the, the school time with children is the best approach. 
And as Carrie mentioned, we now have technology that's presenting new and rapidly changing means to control a partner's behavior. We've all heard of sexting, but just to give you some idea of some other forms of technological abuse, one in 14 say that they've been called names, harassed, or put down by their partners through cell phones and texting. One in five teen girls, one in 10 younger teen girls have electronically sent or posted nude or semi-nude photos and videos of themselves. And even more have sent or posted sexually su suggested, suggestive, excuse me, text, email, or instant messages. And more than half of these girls say it's pressure from a guy is the reason that they do this. So this is something that's a growing problem that I think many adults are kind of struggling to keep up with and understand how to respond to. And again, for some of our more marginalized populations, they can be at greater risk for abuse, generally have fewer resources, and can be abused in particular ways, like for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer youth. Another common form of abuse is to threaten to out someone in a situation where perhaps they're not comfortable for that to happen. And if they're trying to parent together, or even if they're not parenting together, often they may not be taken seriously in terms of seeing whether or not abuse can even exist in a same-sex relationship, and not to mention the kind of bullying and things that can go on, particularly with gay men. Homeless and runaway youth uh, may be staying somewhere that isn't necessarily safe, but it's safer than being on the streets. Um, of course, we know that some of our more marginalized youth might trade sex just for keeping a roof over their head or food. It's hard to find all of these youth and to know where to best to intervene with them. And we don't always have the kinds of resources and support that might be available to address their needs. When working with all youth, we have to remember to be age appropriate. That means that we have to be thinking about their developmental uh, growth and where they are and able to listen to what we have to say. We have to maintain confidentiality, and often this can be a struggle in working with younger people. And one of the things that I would say from my previous work as a clinician as well is when you're working with teens, don't assume that anyone is safe to give them their pregnancy test results in front of, not their mothers, not their fathers, not um, anyone, ex only in complete privacy. Again, uh, thinking about policies that affect this population. Again, understanding the resources that are in your community and knowing where to send youth for support. And with young people, even more so than with adults, context is incredibly important. These young people have neighborhoods, families, peers, schools, and other settings which are having an impact on their abilities or inabilities to cope with the situation. And these are also their potential sources of strength and support and need to be considered when we're responding to them. And as with adults, in terms of our response, being nonjudgmental, empathetic, being current, conducting danger assessment and safety planning, and consider using the stages of change model as a guide. Stages of change model, which has historically been used for changing behaviors such as um, addiction, has also been used in uh, looking at how to be appropriate in terms of moving a young person in front of you from one stage um, to another in terms of their recognizing whether or not they're in an abusive relationship. And that means rather than sort of uncovering that something is abusive and telling them they need to get out, but perhaps helping them to understand that it's abusive and over the course of time leading them up toward taking action. And finally, Healthy Teen Network did a few reports um, over the last few years on looking at the relationship to interpersonal violence and adolescent pregnancy. The first one, implications for practice and policy, focused primarily on what we see as the impact for young women. And the second one, Boys Will Be Boys, looks at the relationship between child maltreatment and family violence on the sexual, reproductive, and parenting behaviors of young men. That is a pretty particularly interesting report, and what it tells us is that as long as we continue to define masculinity in very limited ways, and as long as we remain as homophobic as we are in our country, we will have a hard time allowing young boys to be able to also talk about their own victimization. And without that, um, and without the possibility to intervene with them, they are more likely themselves to grow up to be abusive, thus perpetuating the cycle. Um, additional resources, as was mentioned, is Family Violence Prevention Fund and abuse.org. 
who have a number of very nice teen-related resources, and there is also a National Teen Dating Abuse Hotline, which is listed on their website as well. And I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, um, it is now we've now moved into the section of our talk, it's the question and answer period. Um, I have a handful of questions here already. If you have questions, please send them in. And don't use the raise your hand uh, icon there. Go ahead and actually put your question, type your question in. Okay, our um, the first question is for David. There's a question about the group in Seattle that's piloting the program that you talked about. Do you know, can you tell anyone, tell the audience what that is? Um, I'd have to get those details for you. I don't have it at my fingertips, I'm afraid. Okay. It's, a, it's, a, it's a community youth group, though. Okay, and we're, um, on a somewhat related point, um, there was a question about um, primary prevention and changing behaviors of young men. And uh, that, of course, made me think of the results from the fourth R evaluation. And I was wondering if you could talk about those because I believe there were differential effects for men and for boys and girls. Yes, um, for the fourth R, we had. Um, assess them at the fall of grade nine, in which case we found in terms of the more severe forms of physical violence, it was very low, which as you expect. And then we, we uh, initiated the program in grade nine, and we followed them until the end of grade 11, two and a half years, and assessed their self-reported uh, dating violence, again, for physical violence. We were interested. We had to settle on something that was very concrete. We couldn't look at all different types of outcomes for a randomized trial. And what we found is that it was significant for boys, but not for girls. And compared to the controls, um, overall, at the beginning of grade nine, boys and girls had rates less than 1%. Now, that's different to what Carrie had presented earlier, because that was victimization data. Plus, we're talking about younger kids. These are 15-year-olds and 14-year-olds um, in the extreme forms, more extreme forms of hitting and punching. By the end of grade 11, it was 7% for boys in the who didn't receive the program, and less than 3% for those who did. But the girls remained at 12% uh, in both groups. And we're just about to publish a paper on why that might be. Um, we have some theories. Part of it is that our program and others have been developed from a male perspective of what boys need to prevent violence. Um, and the violence, as we know, with girls is different, but it, it also is predicted by different variables. When we went back and looked at grade 9, the girls are predicted by more and, uh, proximal issues around stress and whether they use uh, their drinking alcohol and that kind of thing. Uh, that predicts their dating violence, whereas if it's boys, it's, it's more distal things such as a history of maltreatment. So they kind of come into the relationship expecting uh, a certain gender role. And the girls come into a relationship and respond to uh, situations and, and might punch or hit. And uh, again, the consequences are different, but we really want to address both of those. Thank you. Oh, there's a poll going here. Okay, um, I have a question for Dr. Miller. Um, the question is what we could do to work with boys and young men around issues of birth control sabotage and pregnancy coercion. And actually, um, Dr. Miller, if you'd start, and then we can ask Dr. Publicity to speak to that also. Absolutely. So the question is about engaging men and boys in addressing to preventing birth control sabotage, condom manipulation, and pregnancy coercion. And I am really excited to, excited to report that one of our sort of new partnerships um, through the Family, Family Violence Prevention Fund is with um, Men Can Stop Rape, um, where we will start, I think, with focusing on college-age young men to help us really think about how to um, talk about um, reproductive autonomy as a, as a concept, I think, um, you know, in a lot of the discussions around, you know, what's the prevention message? Um, it's the notion that, um, you know, the, the decisions around um, getting pregnant um, and having a baby are ones that really need to respect um, a woman's reproductive autonomy and how that, um, you know, how we to do the appropriate messaging, I think it's going to be something really exciting to work on, on over the next um, few years um, with college-age men. 
Now the question of, you know, how does this get worked into comprehensive um, sexuality education moving forward? I think, you know, certainly we absolutely need to include pregnancy coercion, birth control sabotage discussions in um, existing pregnancy prevention curricula and whether that's through vignettes and role play and so forth, but being very, very explicit um, in the curricula that healthy relationships means a relationship that's free of violence, but a relationship that is respectful of reproductive autonomy and is also free of coercion. And I think that notion of integrating healthy relationships into comprehensive sex ed is definitely a direction that we need to take the field. Um, yes, I would I would agree with everything that that um, was just said. I think that the best way to reach boys is to start early and start young in terms of them understanding what it is that you know what are the expectations for them in relationships as well. And I also think that we haven't done as good a job in speaking to young boys in terms of their role in in family planning, as some of us would call it. But in terms of thinking about when to have children, that decision, and I. I think that the more we can engage them in sort of thinking about what that means for them as well would be useful. And as I said, the resource that we did in terms of the young men, we really do have to figure out how to better uh, address the histories that young men might bring with them and be more open to that and helping them to be able to speak about some of their own histories and their own fears so that uh, some of the machismo or, or the homophobia or the different things that drive some of these behaviors can be addressed as well. Pat, I think that's absolutely right. I think the understanding the, the range of motivations for birth control sabotage and pregnancy coercion is an area that, that we're certainly exploring. From some of our preliminary work, it ranges from you know, boys talking about wanting to have a family, um, in many ways a family that they themselves may not have had, um, getting to the critical importance of understanding the kind of victimization that many young men have experienced. Um, that is then, you know, added to involvement in gangs where the number of girls that you have gotten pregnant, unfortunately, is tied to one seniority within certain gangs. Um, and that context, getting back to what Pat was saying earlier about how critical context and histories are for targeting our interventions, I think is really critical. Our next question. Um, Asked about the correlation between substance abuse and the prevalence of teen dating violence. There's also a related question about a question about mental health issues and uh, teen dating violence. I'm going to open that up to anybody who feels that they can speak to that those issues. Is there anybody who done any work on or knows much about either of those? And I can. Do you want to start, Ed? I missed the first part of the question. I'm sorry. First part of the question was about the correlation between substance um, abuse and or substance use and abuse and teen dating violence. And the second part was about mental health issues and teen dating violence. Well, um, they are certainly associated, but they're not causally associated. I mean, so many kids experiment with alcohol and drugs in that age group that they're kind of in parallel. And, you know, both of them, I, I, would, I would argue that the um, dating violence is follows from the substance abuse issues, but we don't know that, that it's all causal. Um, and because of the experimentation that's going on at this point and the fact they don't know how to handle the pressures from peers and from, from uh, romantic partners, there's, there's, it's just a, a lot of sparks can fly. So I don't have the actual numbers, so we haven't, we don't look at that specifically in terms of whether kids are doing one versus the other, but we, we do measure um, the fact that they're doing both. I hope that was helpful. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add, this is Liz, um, I'll add a little bit more too, is that um, you know, in the same way that coercion appears around issues of reproductive and sexual health, you also see coercion related to substance use. And so in our work, I didn't present today, we had, um, uh, the youth talk about experiences of being forced to drink or forced to use drugs um, by their partner. 
um, and found that both in our quantitative as well as qualitative work. So there is you know, certainly, again, that, that close association, but it's really difficult to say which comes first because they're so um, interrelated. Um, the same holds true for, for mental health in that um, multiple studies have now looked at the relationship between um, adolescent relationship abuse and depression and suicidality as well as disordered eating. The challenge with most of those studies is that they were taken at a single point in time and so that all we can tell you is that they're closely associated but not necessarily which came first. Um, when you start to parse out using the limited longitudinal data that we have in adolescence, there is a suggestion that um, depression is a vulnerability for um, adolescent relationship abuse, for being a victim. There is also a suggestion that conduct disorder, um, you know, again, sort of, I cringe when I sort of utilize these sort of diagnostic categories so liberally, but um, these studies are looking at things like conduct disorder, inattention, so ADHD, um, oppositional defiance disorder as predictors of perpetration of um, partner violence. So, um, and then certainly there are a number of studies that are trying to look at the consequences of adolescent relationship abuse on mental health. And there is certainly a handful of studies now that suggest that experiencing adolescent relationship abuse does increase your risk for suicidality and increases your risk for depression. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Pat, there was a question about your comment on TANAP. Um, and uh, there's a, one of our, our listeners is an advocate and uh, she's never heard of that housing stipulation and she wanted to know if it was state specific or age specific. It's age you know. specific. That um, young people have to live with an adult and that includes a pregnant or parenting teen um, in order to receive TANF benefits. It's part of, um, uh, so if a 16-year-old is pregnant, for example, they're not emancipated in that way. So if they want to receive TANF support while they continue to go to school, they have to live with some sort of an adult. And that may not be, um, it doesn't, in, sometimes they will leave an abusive relationship and go into sort of a group housing kind of setting that can also fulfill, but it may also be the kind of thing where they stay with um, an abusive partner who might be an adult significant partner or might be in an abusive family of origin. Excellent, thank you. Um, let's see, I had a very good question from a Robert Kettern Barnes, and then he asked me if I received the question and I, the original question went away. Do you, uh, Jim, are you there? Do you know why that would have happened and where I could find it? Um, unfortunately, I don't. <laughs> um, if if you would like to ask it again. Can you just send me the original question? You were my next question and so now it's it was, it was about translational research and, and adapting programs, but we'll get to that in the very next one. Um, um, so, um, there was a question about whether anyone was aware, and I, I'll direct this to Pat, of um, good training on sexting and latest um, abuse with technology. No, I'm not really aware of any good training on it. Um, I know. I saw that Family Violence Prevention Fund has a campaign that they're running called That's Not Cool, and um, it sort of it, it is using public service announcements and things to kind of talk to teens and to help uh, to use the technology itself to get the message across to teens about that it's not okay to use technology in that way. But I'm not aware of anybody who's actually developed any kind of training or support for providers to learn more about that. Okay. I, the, uh, the one thing that I am aware of is the National Network to End Domestic Violence has a project uh, called Safety Net, and I would just recommend looking at their website to kind of what they what they suggest doing and what they're doing. I think that's um, probably a, a good resource on that topic. Okay, here we go. All right, I'm back to uh, to the question that I was asking about before. Um, the efforts to uh, ask he was asking about efforts to translate programs. Um, in community-based organizations and schools that might not have capacity to implement the programs as designed. Um, and to talking about both, there are two questions um, that one was based on and one was based on another question, so I'm going to sort of combine them together. But one is um, the issue of, of trying to adapt the programs in school that might not have all of the 
necessary um, things in place to implement like a long session. Um, what what's going on in that regard? What are you what are your thoughts on that? And then also translation and adaptation for special populations, um, like the ones that we've been talking about in this panel. So David, let me start with you, and then first on the, on the first topic, which is what do you do when a school doesn't have? I know in Canada things are a little bit different. You have a lot more sessions that you're allowed to devote to these types of issues than we seem to find here. Well, our program right now is 21 lessons. So it's 28 hours of class time, which is sounds like a lot, um, but that's all they get compared to any other subject. Uh, we're working on that, but you know, our goal is really to introduce it gradually over many years. But uh, it's now in schools across Canada, and it's taken off quicker than I thought because you, the good part is you already have teachers, and they're usually pretty eager to do this, and they appreciate the value of it. They haven't had any background training in teachers' college about it. We do a one-day training for them, and we localize it in regions or hubs so that people can get uh, the training that they need. And then they adapt it. We encourage them to adapt it to their local communities or needs. Um, there's five communities that I mentioned in the states that are doing it, and we're just at the point now where we are looking at that translation because it's, uh, it's, it's more challenging when you're moving from south southwestern Ontario, which is 85, 90 percent Caucasian, to the Bronx, to Boston, to Providence. Um, and we encourage them to find other ways to, to make it relevant, to change some of the examples in that. But the, the fundamental content can remain the same. Um, there was a second question there that I've forgotten. Well, I think you sort of you addressed probably both questions, which is adaptations for special populations of youth. Yeah, it, it, yes, you can adapt it. Um, we we adapt it for our uh, First Nations populations, for example, but um, it's. It's not that difficult, really, for even in under-resourced schools, as long as the educators are part of the adaptation, because they know what the requirements are. They know what they have to teach. A lot of times, they are already teaching some of these things. They're just not focusing on the relationship part. They're just teaching sex. They're just teaching substance use. They may be teaching something around um, violence or abuse, but they're not teaching enough about the relationship aspects that connect all of these things. And that's, that's, that's where they find that, yes, it is in the curriculum. I can find the time to do it if I simply uh, shift how I do this bit. Thank you. Canada sounds so wonderfully progressive. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was from Florida, so I would agree with you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Do, uh, do either of you have anything you want to add on this program adaptation? I'll move on to the next question. Go for it. Um, let me uh, turn this question to you. Uh, how would you recommend introducing discussions about reproductive autonomy, pregnancy coercion, and birth control sabotage into an abstinence-only curriculum? <laughs> I love that question. <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, it's very. Uh, That's yeah. No, I think a lot, right? Yeah. No, and I and I think that. Um, that you can actually have conversations around, um, you know, depending on, you know, what the, the sort of the language of the abstinence only curriculum, one can actually to take on the, um, um, that language to really focus on this concept of the autonomy um, of one's body. And the reason I'm thinking about this is I actually did a parent workshop this weekend. Um, I'm Jewish and we do a lot of outreach in the Jewish community here in Sacramento. And um, the, 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 the focus there was on sacred choices. And, um, and so it was really about how to have conversations with your adolescent child about um, the, the sanctity of your body, um, and when people are trying to make you do things that you don't want to do, to make sure that our young people are equipped with the skills on how to keep, how to stay safe. And I think that's really one of the real power of David's, David Wolf's work is that it's very focused on skills. We know very well that telling young people, you know, not to do this or that is not going to work. And so even within abstinence-only curricula, there's ample opportunity to talk about and practice the skills of recognizing coercion and knowing what to do when they've got that gut feeling that somebody's crossing the line. Thank you. 
Anyone want to add anything on that challenging question? That was excellent. We um, have a we have a Catholic version of our program, and uh, again, it's um, a lot of the teachers say that they will teach both messages, but the uh, the Catholic version just removes that, and they still teach the skills as much as as we can go, mm -hmm. as far as we can go with that. Yeah. All right. Um, we have another question um, about engaging parents, which uh, Liz was just mentioning. We know that young people learn um, from experiences from their role models. Um, is there any work that engages parents and other adults in this education effort? Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that I know that there is, but I'll let you guys go ahead and, and answer and answer that question. We'll start with Liz because I know you're involved in the evaluation that you mentioned. Sure. So, um, you know, in terms of the parent engagement piece, I think um, for those of you who are not aware of the MADE campaign, it's M-A-D as in dog, E, um, that was um, supported by Liz Claiborne Incorporated. You can get to that um, website through loveisnotabuse.com. And there is a campaign across the country engaging parents to be advocates for adolescent relationship abuse education within their communities. And it's an absolutely outstanding um, to way to, to give parents really something to focus on. Um, and um, we've certainly found in Sacramento that many parents um, find that engaging at that sort of advocacy level is really um, exciting. I also know that David has done some amazing work, as I certainly rely heavily on your booklets and so forth, David, on um, that are specifically for parents on how to talk about healthy relationships and adolescent relationship abuse. Yes, uh, we have, we're supposed to have four of them. Right now we have two, but it's what parents need to know about teens. And then we have handouts in the program that the kids take home with them to the extent possible. Um, so the parents are made aware of what the kids are learning at school. Um, we're encouraging kids to talk about it because we don't want parents to be threatened by this. And in fact, we've, we've had a very good response to that. Parents generally understand it once they're informed. Um, you don't want backlash thinking that the kids are being taught something that should be taught in church or school or at home. Um, so, but parents, on the other hand, are not very active. So the best way to engage them, we find, and other researchers have found, is, is passively flooding them with as much information as possible um, and uh, hope for the best because there's, there's, it's very difficult in the school-based program to get parents directly active in, with, with their teens. Paul, do you want to add anything on the issue of um, parent involvement? No, I don't think I really have anything significant to add. I think that the struggles have been um, sort of well pointed out. You know, it's interesting that it's so much the same issues that we have uh, with uh, just general sex ed among kids as well, you know, just in trying to, <coughs> excuse me, I'm so sorry, in trying to engage parents and just kind of talking with their children all along the spectrum, which again is why if we start young and build it, the parents are building with them and maybe it's not as threatening. Um, on that on that note, we, I'm, I am aware of um, Nancy Sochi has um, put together a series of booklets called Families for Safe Safe, and I know there was uh, evaluation research done on that, and those booklets are sent to parents, and then there's activities to do with your kid, and then there's a peer educator that's involved, and then and does follow-up phone calls with the parents. Um, I'm not an expert on that by any means, but I, I would, I'm aware of that. So you could look that up also if you're interested. Uh, the next question is um, whether anyone, is, and I, I think I'll direct this to David probably, um, the, about the connection between the perpetration of witnessing domestic violence as children in the home and then the perpetration of uh, violence in adolescent relationships. And if you could speak to what we know about that relationship, that would be great. Um, there is certainly a connection. And as I say, maltreatment is the best predictor you have for boys. Of whether they're going to be abusive in the dating relationship, but it's and when we look at it though, um, in terms of specifically whether they witnessed or whether they were a victim, there's not a big difference. It's whether they've experienced any type of uh, abusive or unhealthy relationships. The numbers are too small generally, even even when you have thousands of kids, to really be able to look at that. But 
um, I'm pretty confident from this, the samples that we've had over the years that it is, remains one of the best predictors, especially for boys. Um, and uh, it seems to be that they, they repeat those same patterns, yes. Thank you. Um, you know, this is, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, this is the topic that we explored to a, a great extent in the Boys Will Be Boys um, uh, paper that we did that's on our website as well. Uh, looked at just as much as we could among how this experience of either child maltreatment or family violence impacted the sexual reproductive and parenting behaviors of young men. And a lot of it is retrospective data. A lot of it is asking adult men or adolescents now kind of going back to admit to, to admit um, issues of violence in their past and to talk about different behaviors. But it is still very interesting that um, it is a little unclear sometimes, but there's definitely a relationship. Yeah, I'm going to uh, pass this question for you. Um, do you happen to know how many additional resources, activities, audiovisual aids, um, or other, other, yeah, can you not hear me? No. Um, if you know of any additional resources, um, activities, audiovisual aids, reading materials that can be used to address young boys about gender roles and male domination, um, I don't, unfortunately. I would say that there's been some interesting work that, um, God, what's their name? Is the group in Philadelphia? I'm having a moment here. Let me think about it. They do video productions and me productions, M-E-E -E productions, has done some interesting stuff. It's not necessarily what you would talk with young boys about, their gender identity, but they've done some really interesting videos showing young people who are talking about um, relationships and males and females and kind of how they look at all of that. And it can be, it's pretty startling stuff. It's actually pretty intense stuff that can be used um, to, with a more of a high school age group, I would say. Young people, I'm not really aware of uh, too much that's going on. Maybe others have better ideas. Um, of, uh, so, sure, I would say um, on this is Liz on the um, subject of engaging men and boys. Um, our folks across the globe, whether it be in Brazil or South Africa or India, are so far ahead of us. It's um, it's really kind of embarrassing, and I certainly hope that in that that. Um, you know, doing more programming, specifically focusing on um, shifting um, norms related to masculinity and um, you know, sort of positive messaging around masculinity is something that um, many of the advocates on the phone will be working on. Um, in terms of the the immediate program that I touched on, coaching boys into men, is, is very very situated in that kind of social norms change. In addition, the Family Violence Prevention Fund has been working primarily with adult men around um, fatherhood. So this, and the program is called Fathering After Violence. And we have just, you know, started to explore what fathering after violence would look like, look like for um, parenting um, adolescent men. So adolescent men who are um, who are parents, and whether something like fathering after violence could be adapted for um, for that population. Thank you. Uh, I have a question specifically directed to Dr. Miller. Um, are are those who are conducting comprehensive sex education receptive to integrating? Excuse my ignorance here, or my brain is just not working. A R A. Do you know what that is? Adolescent relationship abuse. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, so the question then is, are those who are conducting comprehensive sex education receptive to integrating adolescent relationship abuse in a significant way? Um, and any suggestions on integrating these topics into pre-existing evidence-based programs used in schools? Absolutely. So I think, you know, certainly I'm, you know, out here in, um, you know, California, and I, so, you know, for, certainly in California, the folks for whom we have connected with at the state level around comprehensive sex ed and introducing healthy relationships discussions into and integrating that into comprehensive sex ed have been incredibly open. Um, we've got a bill, you know, that we're working on this year 
um, on the integration of um, adolescent relationship abuse into sexual and reproductive health education. So um, I certainly am feeling very optimistic. I think it's one of those things that is kind of a no-brainer. Um, I'm going to personalize it for a moment and say my <clears throat> daughter who um, now two years ago when she was in sixth grade um, came home complaining about the um, family life education that she had had that day. And I said, well, what was wrong with it? And she said, you know, they talked about sperm and eggs and never once talked about people. And I think that that really captures where, you know, we, the, those of us who are, you know, violence prevention advocates can totally make a difference because, in fact, why are we talking about sperm and egg when we haven't had the opportunity to talk about what healthy relationships look like, about intimacy, and, you know, sort of all of that as the basic foundation. And so thus far, I have to say, you know, I'm, I'm of course, such a glass is, you know, always half full kind of gal, but I'm really optimistic that this conversation around healthy relationships integrated into existing curricula is totally the way to go. In fact, I'm actually nervous about attempts to say we now have to add on teen dating abuse into, um, you know, as an extra curriculum because I honestly don't think that schools are going to be willing to give up time. But if we can say we're going to make your curricula better and more effective by really starting with some of the core issues that are really meaningful to kids. They actually really want to talk about what's going on in their friendships and relationships rather than, you know, the horrendous pictures of sexually transmitted infections that they get, sub, you know, subjected to. And I'll get off the soapbox now. That's okay. <laughs> off the slide. Um, there was a question about danger assessments and are there any specific ones suggested for use with teen parents? I'm not aware of teens a, at all. Uh -huh. I'm not aware of a separate dangerous danger assessment tool that's been developed for teen parents or teens. I believe um, I believe this, that the danger assessment tool that was developed by Jackie Hample and gets used and often in the field as far as I'm concerned is probably adequate, but others might have other opinions. Liz or David, do you know of anything specific for teens? No, I don't have one that's specific for teens, and um, certainly that is, you know, in my own trainings and so forth is what I have incorporated as well. I, Jackie Campbell. Jackie Campbell's, absolutely. Uh -huh. I did see a safety planning tool that was specific for teens on family violence prevention funds, and there is the power and control wheel specific for teens that's been developed that's out of the Minnesota group that did so much work for so many years. So there are those tools that have been developed that might help it um, that I think are helpful aids when you're talking with teens because they kind of approach from um, that sort of level of relationship. Um, particularly the power and control wheel is kind of interesting. Absolutely, and there's another new um, resource that's going to be coming online, I believe, next week, and I think, Jim, you can pull it up on our resource page, but this was a, the um, oh, absolutely fabulous collaboration between the Runaway Homeless Youth Programs and Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Agencies. Um, and it's a, it's a toolkit specifically focused on homeless and marginalized youth. But actually, as I was reviewing those resources um, today, there are um, if, the assessment for adolescent relationship abuse, the tools that are actually provided on there would be very appropriate, um, not only for homeless and marginalized youth. And that should be available, I believe, on Monday. Thank you. I'm going to turn us in a different direction. Uh, there have been two questions now on specific research on female violence against male partners in adolescents. I'm going to turn that question over to you all. And um, I will note that I, um, Peggy Giordano and I published an article in the um, NIJ Journal on that very topic. Um, so I could fill in if there's gaps after you speak. Does anyone want to, you want to start with that, David? Well, <laughs> um, a lot of us are finding that girls are reporting higher rates. So in terms of the consistency of that, yes, girls say they hit their boyfriends, uh, romantic partners, more often than boys say they do it. Um, and the methods that they're using are, are they're not the same, but they are abusive. And 
that, as I mentioned earlier, that's why we went back to look at the data. And it seems to be that girls are hitting for different reasons, and we're not getting the message across to them. If I can speculate, it's similar to what I used to hear from boys and men back in the 80s. When, when you'd raise this issue with the boys and the men, it was like um, they were so used to this. They'd seen it so much on TV and so forth that it was no big deal. You know, I didn't hurt her. I didn't do it. You know, I didn't really mean to, to hurt her or something. That's what we're hearing from girls today, um, that it's no big deal or I was, you know, he wasn't listening to me. And they're, shelf, they're, they're um, shrugging it off as if it's inconsequential. The boys will often laugh. Um, sometimes, at least in front of other boys, uh, to shrug it off, to make it seem like it's no big deal or I can take it, um, so the girls get the message that, that this is the best way to get his attention. So we have a lot of work to do there. Um, the girls are using these methods. There's a lot of role models for using these methods for girls. It's different dynamics altogether, but I, again, um, I think with some clear education around it, some clear messages as to why it's wrong, regardless of the consequences, um, uh, we can get through to them. Do uh, either uh, Dr. Miller or Dr. Bruce, do you have anything you want to add on that? No, not really. I mean, I've seen a lot of reports as well that, that the reports of girls abusing guys is definitely on the rise, but I haven't, I don't have anything in particular to quote. Yeah, I, uh, Dr. Wolf talked about the different reasons and the different explanations that they have for um, for using violence or aggression in their relationships. Another difference seems to be the the outcomes of the aggression and violence that it, it or the types of aggression and violence that are used that tend to be more more harm is reported by girls. So and more sexual violence is perpetrated against girls. But yeah, in terms of uh, physical hitting type behavior that's you know, that's exactly what we point out in the article. But we talk about some of the reasons why um, the the adult uh, intimate partner violence framework may not be as, um, you know, we can't just take it full scale into an adolescent relationship context, but there are some differences in adolescent relationships that are important to understanding those, those dynamics. Um, both one of the major things is that a lot of an adolescent relationship takes place in a very public way which is very, I think, quite different than adult relationships. Um, let me see, we've got, I, there was a good question about um, sort of where we start, what, how, how young should we be starting to engage um, kids in these kinds of conversations? And I mean, this could have been a polling question, I suppose. Maybe it should be a polling question. Um, can we do that, Jim? Sure, um, can you just, uh, you know, it is. Repeat it one more time. I'm sorry. Sure. sure. Um, at what age should we start engaging in these kinds of conversations about relationship abuse with our kids? I'm echoing back to myself. Sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the commercials of while he's putting that up, one of the ads that I saw that was developed. Well, actually, yeah, I guess it was used as an ad. I saw it as part of a perpetrator training that I went to. Um, that uh, they showed a young boy, as some, some people might recall this, but they showed a young boy, well, actually I think it starts out with the uh, mother's in the kitchen, although you don't really see her, you just hear her, and then you hear the father come in, and then you hear the abuse begin, and you hear it begin to really escalate until you know that the woman is being physically abused, and if they, then they show a young boy coming down the stairs from the second to the first floor, and he stops kind of at the top of the stairs and just sits and listens um, to his father hitting his mother. And they, when I saw it, they were using it in perpetrator training to kind of talk to the men about taking them back to when they were young, if they witnessed this, and what kind of impact it had on them and what they did with those emotions. But in, in the context of what you're talking about, Terry, the question that came up, I don't think it's, you know, think very, very young is not too young because especially if kids have been witnessing this, the opportunity to be able to kind of think about and talk about and hear that there um, is, are different kinds of relationships and some may not be the best, uh, of course, age appropriate and all of that is, uh, 
And it's the same as, as sex ed as far as I'm concerned. You start young with kind of what's age appropriate and build it up, and it's just a healthy, normal conversation that um, goes on through time, and I think it's much more successful that way. I agree 100%, and that uh, the whole idea here is that it shouldn't just be something we pounce on them in grade 9 or 10 or 11 um, and tell them that they're doing things wrong. We have to be telling them what's right all along the way. We teach them how to wear seat belts and not to smoke and don't drive with drunk drivers and all this kind of stuff when they're younger, wear the bike helmets, but we don't tell them anything about relationships other than what to fear. And the message the kids will listen to when they're little are the healthy relationships what do you look for in a friend and, and so forth, and then they'll understand what, what not to look for. We have to start, that's really the goal, when it's like to, trying to teach uh, addition and subtraction before you get into calculus. And the, I think we're going to get there in the next generation of kids. Gradually the schools are going to see that this is something that's very much part of our health curriculum, uh, very natural to teach. It's not threatening. You don't have to go in there and talk just about the bad stuff, but it's a lot easier for kids to bring up what might be going on at home if they understand what's wrong about it and who they can talk to. I agree with that completely. And we have a related um, question, and that is that if do we think that um, the value and worth of a teen girl was instilled in her in earlier years in her life, that maybe the question that poses her selection of men wouldn't be um, she wouldn't tolerate physical or sexual abuse, but more broadly, that not just for selection men, but that that girls wouldn't tolerate physical or sexual abuse, and that boys also wouldn't. It seems that our poll is indicating a very strong agreement with that idea, as I assume everybody can see this, and we're showing very, almost very few people thinking that we shouldn't start before age 10. So, um, which is quite interesting considering almost everything that's done on this topic is done in mostly in high school and a little bit in middle school. Mm -hmm. so. Right. Um, Jim, I have another question for you. Um, are we, is there a way that we can post the resources that are coming to me as questions? It's not really very feasible for me to just keep reading off these people are sending me answers to some of our, you know, we know about this program or that. Um, I think, uh, well, uh, certainly what we can do is um, add any resources that are coming into the resources list, which I've been calling up periodically, and, um, you know, there's already a lot of great um, stuff listed there that you've all sent me, but um, we can certainly update that as you, um, as all of you keep talking about new resources and receive additional ones from the audience. Will that help? That will definitely help. And uh, other people have asked about um, how they will get access to the presentations and such. Is that, are you going to are you going to mention that at the end, or does everyone get an email? Or? Yeah, sure. I'll uh, I'll re um, uh, I'll remind everybody that we are going to um, send you an email in about two to three business days and um, let you know when both the recording of the event has been posted and when the uh, presentation slides, pending uh, presenters' permission, um, when they're posted as well. Okay, and I wanted to let all of the people who have, um, I'm going to probably pull up just a couple more questions, but for those of you who didn't get your questions answered here, um, some of them um, we can answer, we all have access to this, and we can type answers directly to you. Um, and, so I wanted to let you know that there was one question about um, for David. What incentives are there for schools and community-based organizations with limited resources to invest in buying programs like the Fourth R and other evidence of safety, et cetera, um, instead of relying on programs and activities and you know pulling things together from different places? Well. I guess part of that is what they feel would be the most valuable to them, but the real benefit I think is the teachers really like it. It makes it um, much easier to teach when you've got a well-written curriculum that's been evaluated, that's laid out for you with all the resources, and it, it's not meant to replace public health nurses or other other community partners that come into the schools. It's it's meant to embellish that so that the 
so that those responsibilities aren't just shunted to someone else. The teacher coordinates it and helps, and the youth committees in the school are designed to also provide input and assistance and guidance and community involvement. So um, the incentive really is that the teachers find it more pleasant to do, um, more structured, and the resources are there for them. They're the, everything from handouts to, and, uh, to overheads and videos and that kind of thing. I just, I'm, I'm against the, or I think feel we have to move on from the model of, of one-shot deals where we think that we can deal with teen dating violence with a one-hour lecture from someone from the community. That, that person's been on their back for many years to try to resolve these issues and all they're given is an hour. And I think what we have to say is the school's now opening up and being, preparing itself to recognize their important role in this, not just for teen dating violence, but for healthy relationships and other forms. And that will, that's the incentive they'll have. Okay. Plus the whole field of reproductive health, I mean, we're in such a place where we rely on evidence-based models, you know, that, and we promote evidence-based models that I would hope that um, just wanting to do something that has been proven to be effective would be an incentive because, in fact, it's, it's money well spent as opposed to cobbling together something that might have cost less but might not really have the impact. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing I should mention is it's not very expensive, and it's, I'm not here to sell the program because we don't even sell it in the states yet. Um, it's uh, it's sixteen dollars a student is what it calculated down to for us, and that's just the first year. After that, it goes down because it's it's just teacher resources. There's no book for the students or, or things that would that would uh, have to be purchased every year. It's just a curriculum with with the videos and things for teachers. So it's. It's an investment up front, but I'd say pretty cheap when compared to what it costs uh, to deal with the aftermath. Um, I have a question. And uh, I, right before I came on here, I was reading the uh, Family Violence Prevention Fund uh, developed a guide on home visiting and intimate partner violence. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on um, addressing some of these issues through um, home visiting programs, you know, family partnership type programs, um, you know, exactly. whichever of you would like to answer. Well, I would, I, I mean, I'll start by saying because of the pregnant parenting teen, I talk a lot about the isolation that they might have if they're in the home, and certainly home visiting programs have been shown to be effective. Home visiting models have been shown to be effective with pregnant parenting teens on a number of fronts, such as the nurse family partnership, but even some other models in terms of um, improving their parenting, their effectiveness of parenting, reducing child abuse among pregnant and parenting teens, um, and delaying subsequent births and a number of other indicators. So it certainly seems like uh, the model itself works well with this population. And so using it to also begin to identify and support and, and do what they can to promote healthier relationships and uh, identify abusive relationships makes absolutely great sense to me. Absolutely. I've got the um, tool in front of me right now. And you all can get the um, the safety card that was developed by the Family Violence Prevention Fund for home visitation programs. And I think what's really quite um, remarkable about um, sort of the, the potential of home visitation programs is that they are serving both the young mom and the new baby. And so it's an opportunity to talk about how a healthy or an unhealthy relationship is impacting both mom's health as well as the baby's health. And you'll see in the um, in the resource card that it talks about things like creating safe homes, talking about one's own childhood and what impact that might have on one's parenting, how children are affected in homes where there has been violence and abuse. Um, and I just, um, I have high hopes for home visitation programs being a really important place for integrating um, discussions of adolescent relationship abuse. Well, this is your last question. How does an advocate get the information out to the schools, or how can you engage schools in, in trying to get them to spend more time on these subjects? David, what would you recommend? How do you, how do you get the right advocates, and how do you get schools to spend more time? How do, how do advocates help in that regard to get schools to spend more time on these types of Oh. Stuff? Well, 
let's start at the top. First, they can advocate in terms of uh, teacher college. They can uh, what we've done in several of our colleges in Ontario is, in, is provide them with the curriculum in teacher college to teach the new student classes um, how to how to run safe schools programs. Not just, especially not our program, but how to the importance of safe schools programming. Um, so they come to the schools thinking this is important. It's one of the most popular classes. But more directly, um, there's always advocates, every school, every community in the school, there's teachers and others who value this. We have to find them and, and make sure that, that you promote their opportunities to develop it. Um, sometimes that's done by parents, by uh, evening speaking arrangements with a speaker who can talk about the value of this. We have to shift the thinking from reactiveness and focusing on the bad stuff and talk more about what we want to promote among our youth, and the parents are much more interested in that than some of the schools. So um, I know a lot of the schools, not only in the States, but here in Canada as well, are, are very, uh, when they think of safe schools, they think about barbed wire and gun control. And we have to, we have to remind them that, that it all starts with the relationship aspect. So um, to promote that, to advocate, um, if you're a parent, the best way is to talk to the um, to the parent councils or the administrators to talk about ways that we can integrate it. Um, work with educators to see if there's materials that they, that they could use. And especially through programs like this to share the knowledge so that, because there's always teachers out there that wish they had this information because they'd like to move on, they'd like to move ahead with it. They're tired of using old methods that aren't effective. Absolutely. I certainly would really like to, to echo echo what David just said and also to add that when engaging with schools, you have to speak um, in their language. And as much as all of us would like them to have, you know, stopping violence at the top of their list of priorities, they're really primarily interested in academic performance. And one of the things that you may be able to use is some of the information we presented today on how adolescent relationship abuse is embedded in a whole range of poor health outcomes for adolescents um, that are then tied, obviously, to poor academic outcomes. And um, I think a recognition that, um, you know, if we're saying, you know, part of what we want to do is help those, you know, kids who are struggling. Um, and you know, provide some you know sort of basic skills building that that is ultimately going to tie to helping kids stay in school. And um, you know, I'm again forever the optimist. I, I think that speaking in that language is helpful. Um, along those lines, the National Assembly of School-Based Healthcare um, and the Center for Health and Healthcare in Schools has a lot of um, sort of advocacy. And they're not specific to adolescent relationship abuse, but again, if you take the tack of saying these risk behaviors cluster, that um, you can really show how doing these kinds of community partnerships and bringing in our domestic violence advocates, our sexual assault advocates into the school settings can actually help with academic performance is, you know, one way. Um, it's one particular hook. And I would only add to that that I think that um, often when you're trying to integrate something new into a school, obviously you need some sort of a champion. And I think in schools that the parents can be the champions. And so perhaps going through like the PTA or some kind of parent group in order to get the parents to be on board with this and to understand like all, as David said, all the positives that can offer for their young children because the parents make the demand, the schools are going to be more likely to listen and um, they can perhaps be the champions for getting this um, integrated into the program. Thank you. Okay, well that um, will wrap up our session for today. I did have one, uh, two people asked about getting certificates. Jim, do we do certificates or some proof that they were doing this? Oh, uh, that, that's actually a really great question. And unfortunately, no, we don't offer any continuing credits. Okay. That answers your question then. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much to all of our presenters and to all of you who joined us. And we will continue to answer your questions. Um, my answers will have to be coming uh, tomorrow evening as I'm flying to Dallas. Right. Okay. Guess I'll see you then. Thank you all. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.
question. Do we hang up now? Yeah, we're uh, we're adjourned. Thank you, panel, and uh, I think this was a great event. Thank you to our audience for uh, your participation. So, in terms of continuing to answer questions, do we can, I think you can you can go. Well, actually, what I can do is um, hold on. Let me just stop our recording.